My name is Melissa Michaels, and I was first diagnosed with ovarian fallopian tube cancer on March 17th in the year 2017. And um, I am a year out of completing chemotherapy and about 15 months out from um, any evidence of the disease. So I've had a rigorous ride through this um, treatment but a very blessed one at the same time. Part of my blessings was that I had family and community around me right from the beginning. I called my girlfriends that very day and said that I got diagnosed and said, we need to talk. And um, they came close and we made it a plan for how we were gonna support not only me, but the rest of my family and the people around me as news of this disease in my life was going out into the world and as I navigated my way through it. My parents are both still alive. My husband had buried, has buried a wife to another kind of gynecological cancer and I have grown daughters. And all of these people were very deeply impacted by this diagnosis in addition to what I call my bonus children or my stepchildren who had lost their blood mother to this disease. The ripples were great and people were not only wanting to help in every way they could but they had their own rigorous work of figuring out how to come out of shock themselves and move into states of hope versus hopelessness and despair in the face of this very progressed diagnosis. And I just want to speak to the complexity of being intimately connected with somebody going through this disease. I have walked with many people through cancer, so I've been on all sides of this now. But I, I haven't been a child, and I haven't been a spouse. And I want to say that there were times that with all the extraordinary um, love and longing that they had to be near me and to help me, whether it was with food, whether it was with rides, whether it was with making plans. Sometimes I actually needed for them to go and be with themselves or each other and for me to be with myself. Sometimes we needed space from each other and that wasn't always something easy for us to talk about. We learned how to do that. We learned to accept that there were ways that there was nobody we'd rather be around than each other and that there were times we needed just the opposite. I remember times with my grown daughter who came home, left her life in Puerto Rico to come and be with me. And it was the right thing for her to do for her own professional development too. But also personally, she just there was no question in her mind that she was going to come and care for her mother. And we went on the most epic journey together. There were times we were, we were making cancer jokes. We were hysterical laughing. There were times she was just so overwhelmed with the vulnerability of her mother. And there were times she'd get mad at me because she'd feel like my treatment needed to look different than maybe what I was doing. Or maybe not so much my treatment, my self-care. Because I'm kind of a person who goes, goes, goes. And she would have perhaps loved to have seen me uh, slowing down at times, which really leads to a very important part of how to navigate this complex terrain with the people who love us the most. They have ideas for what might be best for us, and often there's wisdom in their perspective, but ultimately we are our own chief navigator, for better and for worse, and we need to listen to the wisdom of the people who love us but they also perhaps have to back up and learn to honor what we know is right for ourselves. And that's not a, uh, nothing you can read about in a book and no oncologist can advise us on that. That's something we have to thoughtfully, sensitively, respectfully, vulnerably navigate within family systems. And there was a time as we were going through this, I was going through this with my family, that um, we had to sit down one night, my daughter, who was at home as an adult, living with my husband, who's her bonus dad or stepdad, and really have a pretty heavy-duty conversation because we were finding that we were rubbing up against each other. There was fear 
there was anger and there was grief and there wasn't much time to be talking about any of it because everybody was focused on my survival, survivorship. But part of that really did depend on the climate that I was healing in. And so we had to unpack that. We had to take time to tend to not only my heart, but the heart of the people around me so that we could come into a deeper state of vulnerability and harmony and work together. And it wasn't like a one-time thing, but um, there was one point when it was just so thick because we'd been in such a survival game and there was enough spaciousness that we could really um, acknowledge that this was really, really hard on everybody around me. And in some ways it was harder on the people around me in some ways than even me because I could do things about it. I could get in there and get that chemo and move it along and I could, I could be an advocate for myself in a way that the people around me didn't have that same kind of agency or um, opportunity. They had to watch it. And so I just want to say to the children whose parents are going through this, you are not alone. Grown children, young children, everybody is so affected and um, often in some ways not as well cared for, not because anybody is bad or negligent, but because so much focus is going on the person whose life is really being fought for at that moment. And of course spouses, you know, or partners, you become in service to this whole sort of non-stop situation and, and your most intimate other is focusing their energy on their own surviving and the, the sexuality and the intimacy and the conversation is, moves pretty abruptly away from we to me. And that's a selfless space that you sit in. Um, and I don't know that enough tension and care is really given to you all who are, who are also in a total life change. And of course, parents watching your children go through this, I can't imagine siblings. Uh, there's really nothing worse than, than that experience of watching someone go through something who, who really you imagined was going to outlive you. And my father, who's 94, you know, just wept at my bedside at a certain point once I came through my surgery because he never imagined he would see his child in this position. And the good news is I'm here and I'm able now to turn towards caring for him, which is right relationship. And for that, I'm very grateful. And to all those invisible helpers, let's really remember them and be sensitive to them and realize that when one of us faces this disease, the ripples of shock and impact go far beyond our, our families. They go to our colleagues and to so many others who maybe have lost family members to this horrific disease. And um, let's remember to be sensitive and care for them as we care for ourselves. Thank you.